So my name is Robin Carney. I am what they call lead on the foundation year, um, especially for student experience. In other words, I look after making sure that learning, teaching, and the student experience of the foundation year is great for the whole year. Um, I've also been teaching in SOAS since 2005. And before I started working on the foundation year, I was working um, on the international foundation programs, and then also working, supporting students who are studying their degrees or master's degrees in SOAS with things like study skills, research skills, all the kind of different things you need to know to be a successful student. Um, and then for the last two years, I've been working on the foundation year really since the start, since it began in uh, September of 2019. Um, I have a nice photo of SOAS uh, on the front of my PowerPoint, just in case you haven't had a chance to visit in person. Um, you can see on the right of the photograph is what we call the SOAS main building. To the left is the Brunei building, where there's also an art gallery and a Japanese roof garden. And beyond that, you can't quite see it, although you could always Google it because it's an amazing building, is Senate House. And we have a large wing of Senate House at the University of London. And I wanted to start with a photograph of SOAS because I think one way that SOAS is different to most universities is its location. It's right in the center of London in an area called Bloomsbury. Um, which has a lot of history, especially with respect to education, art and literature. Um, and even though in this photograph, the university looks very quiet, I think one of the great things about SOAS is the sense of community. It really feels like a village. And if you were here now, and especially if you were here in a normal non-COVID affected year, it's a really bustling, exciting, vibrant place to be. Okay, so let me just move on now to have a look at SOAS in general. If you have the prospectus and you can get it very easily online, if you don't um, have it now, just search SOAS undergraduate uh, prospectus. You'll get a more thorough overview of why SOAS is an outstanding university. And it's not just that it has a great reputation in Britain, it has a great reputation globally. It has an international reputation for academic excellence, a really international feel on campus, not only in terms of the student cohort, but also in terms of the teaching and academic cohort. Um, so our students are generally the type of person who's very passionate about global issues and contemporary world issues. Um, and you will find studying in SOAS that you have a huge range of options on what you study, many of them not so available in other universities in the UK. And you'll also find that you have a great range of combinations that you make. So maybe you're interested in law, but also in a Korean language. You can make a combination there. Maybe you're interested in development studies, but also in South Asian art. You can probably make a degree combination there. Um, and another advantage of studying at SOAS is the connections we have with the rest of the world. And 40% of undergraduate programs offer the opportunity to spend a year studying in another country. Okay, so let's move on just to have a little look at the reasons that SOAS is so well regarded academically. And you'll see that SOAS is ranked in the top 150 universities in the world for social sciences. So social sciences are subjects like uh, anthropology, cultural studies, development studies, economics, top 50 in the world for arts and humanities. And that might be of particularly interest in particular interest to you 
if you have an interest in other regions of the world, like Africa, South Asia, East Asia, the Middle East, and art and literature from those areas. Um, it's ranked fifth in the UK for graduate employability, 12th in the UK for economics for course quality, fifth in the world for development studies, 16th in the world for anthropology. This isn't just for Britain, this is for the world. 21st in the world for politics, history in the top 50 in the world. So this isn't just a university with a national reputation, it has a really strong international reputation. Okay, I'll move on now to tell you a little bit more about the foundation year itself. So the aim of the foundation year is to try to help to prepare students for entry onto an undergraduate program at SOAS, and really to try to help them excel on undergraduate programs um, in SOAS. So it's trying to equip you with all the skills and knowledge you need to have an outstanding experience as an undergraduate on a degree here. Um, we have modules on the foundation year on academic practice, working with numbers, digital skills and technology, topical global issues and cultural fluency. So really you're being introduced to different academic skills you'll need and different academic disciplines taught in SOAS. And I'll give you a deeper overview or a more thorough summary of those different modules just in one minute. So we have two foundation year pathways or two options for you if you want to study a foundation year in SOAS. So these are called a BA or so a Bachelor in Arts or a Bachelor in Science in Business Management, Economics and Law, or a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science in Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities. So in other words, we have two pathways tailored towards the type of degree you want to take after the foundation. You might notice that these, these pathways are not called foundation year, they're called a BA or a BSc, because once you're accepted onto the foundation year, you're accepted onto a four year degree. So your first year of that degree is the foundation year. And then once you pass the foundation year, you can go on to any degree in SOAS. So the foundation year is not a standalone qualification. When you finish the foundation year, you don't need to go and apply to UCAS again. Once you're accepted onto the foundation year, you are on a degree in SOAS. It's just that the first year is a foundation year where you build academic skills and academic knowledge. And then maybe in April or sometime in term two of the foundation year, you then make a decision about what degree in SOAS you want to study, whether it's law, Korean, anthropology, development studies, et cetera. And then you go on to that degree once you've passed the foundation year. It's that simple. So now let me just give you a quick overview or a, a more in-depth overview than the introduction I just gave of what you would be studying on the different modules on the foundation. So depending on which pathway you choose, you'll either study Introduction to Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities as a module or Introduction to Business Management, Economics and Law as a module. And these modules continue all year. So you study these modules in term one, term two, and the first weeks of term three. The other core module that you'll be studying all year is academic practice. Um, and then you'll also be studying for one term, the world from SOAS, for one term, the cultural fluency, for one term, digital skills and technology, and for one term, numbers and quantum reasoning. I'll explain in more depth now what they are. So the Introduction to Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities module really tries to introduce you to the key concepts, theories, debates and issues that you'll need to be familiar with to succeed on any Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities course in SOAS. The first term is really an introduction to key ideas and concepts. And then in the second term, each lecture deals with 
a different social science, arts or humanities subject that we teach in science. So maybe the first week of term two will be a lecture introducing you to how we study history in science. And then week two, an introduction to what you would be studying if you took global liberal rights in science. So in that way, it really gives you an overview of what you need to know as a kind of foundation for excelling at a social sciences, arts and humanities subject and so on. But then also gives you a really clear overview of what to expect on those degrees. Okay. And then on the other side, you might choose the business management economics and law pathway, in which case your introduction to business management economics and law module would try to introduce you to the key theories, ideas, concepts, and issues you, or it certainly would be helpful for you to be familiar with if you were planning to go on and study management, economics, finance, or law, and so on. Um, and while these different subjects will be dealt with in categories, so we'd start with business and then move on to management and then on to economics and then on to law, the whole year is cohesive and shows how these different subjects relate to each other, how an understanding of management or certainly an understanding of law could aid you to have a deeper understanding of management or an understanding of economics can help you to have a stronger grasp on business and business studies. So students develop a broad understanding of each discipline, but they also see how each discipline relates to the others. As I said, academic practice continues throughout the year, and this is a core module which really does aim to help you to develop the academic skills you'll need to be an understand an outstanding undergraduate. I think when students arrive in university, they often don't anticipate how different the types of skills you'll need to succeed are compared to secondary school or high school or college. And you might find that students who already maybe have family who've been to college or sorry, who've been to university or friends who've been to university um, in the UK have a great advantage because they understand what's expected. So academic practice really aims to give you an overview of what's expected in terms of the type of study you'll be doing in university and the type of assessments. And academic practice really does try to train you in all the skills you'll need to perform really well at the type of assignments we do in SOAS, which includes academic essays, um, academic presentations, reports, reflective writing. And then in term two on academic practice, the assessment is an independent study project where you take those skills that you've learned in academic practice and you get to apply them to an academic debate issue or problem of your choosing. So it's really like a micro dissertation where in term one, we introduce the different skills you'll need to be an amazing student. And then you get to apply them to a subject that really interests you. Most students, or I would even go as far as say, nearly all students have found this really fulfilling and really great preparation for their degree. Huh. Okay, only four modules to go. Next one is, come on computer, The World from SOAS. In term one, there's a module called The World from SOAS. It's quite a vague or abstract name for a module, but most students by the end of the term find this to be their favorite module. What the World from SOAS is really trying to do is to introduce students to key issues and debates that SOAS generally will take an interest in and to approach those issues and debates from a global perspective. So if you're interested in politics, 
economics, um, even literature, development, anthropology, cultural studies, and you've studied these subjects previously, it's probably been from quite an Anglo-centric or at least Eurocentric perspective. So if you've looked, if for example, you took A-level politics, I imagine that the majority of the key thinkers you read were British, French, German, or American. And politics and world politics were understood through that lens. But in the world from SOAS, we try and look at different disciplines and their different interests and the issues, debates, and problems that they might engage with and look at them from a global perspective. So it really challenges students to reassess their assumptions on why the modern world is the way it is. And students have found this lays a really strong foundation for understanding different academic subjects and disciplines that we study and so on. And then cultural fluency takes a similarly global approach. But what it's looking at here is really the types of academic theories and concepts we might use as university students. So a lot of the time in um, undergraduate studies, what we're doing is taking theories and concepts and then applying them to case studies or applying them to the real world. So having a basis or a grounding in academic theory um, is hugely useful. I think one of the reasons cultural fluency has been so popular and so successful as a module is that students are introduced to these theories and concepts, but then in the assignments and in classwork, get to apply academic theory and concept to the issues that they are really interested in. So for example, the first assessment in cultural fluency is a presentation where students take post-colonial or anti-colonial theory and apply it to their own secondary school or college education. So they ask themselves, for example, to what extent their literature A-levels or psychology A-levels or economics A-levels were reproducing a worldview that was particularly white, Anglo-centric, Eurocentric, or maybe um, mas through a very masculine worldview, and what the alternatives might have been. So the whole point is that although this is academic theory, we're really showing how useful this theory can be for understanding your own life and the context um, and background that you came to university from. Well, it puts it quite well, sorry, it puts it quite well in the PowerPoint there and encourages students to engage critically with their own experiences and environments while applying academic theory to debates and issues that are personally relevant. That sums it up pretty well, I think. Numbers and quantitative reasoning. has a horrible name, if you ask me, as someone who doesn't like mathematics, but this is not a maths module. This is a module which aims to try to help students to build the skills needed to develop academic arguments using evidence and data and to understand and analyze the arguments of others who use numbers and data to support their arguments. Obviously, in the academic world, when you're writing essays or assignments, you're trying to develop an argument and the best way to make your argument persuasive is to use evidence and generally the strongest type of evidence you can use. And particularly in social sciences, economics and business subjects is to use data numbers because they feel like hard fact. So this module really aims to try to help you use data to support your arguments and to understand how data is used in constructing arguments in general. If you're planning to go on to study economics, business, finance, obviously you can see how this module could be essential for you. But social sciences students 
have also found this hugely helpful in relation to the type of reading they need to do as social sciences students and in terms of developing their own arguments and assignments. Digital skills and technology was originally designed as a module which had more of a focus on Hi everybody, uh, apologies about that. Uh, it appears that Robin may have just um, uh, dropped out of Zoom. Um, I suspect it might be due to his um, connection. So hopefully he'll be able to rejoin the session. Um, but just to say, uh, if you do have any questions so far, um, you're welcome to put them into the chat box um, and we can answer those questions um, for you. Uh, and hopefully you're finding um, it to be a very informative session. I can see that Robin has just rejoined, um, which is great. Um, so we'll hand back to you, Robin. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. The internet just cut out. I mean, the, I'm in a corner of the SOAS library. That's where my office is and sometimes doesn't have very good reception. Okay, so you can hear me again, hopefully. Let me get the PowerPoint going again. So to share a screen. Okay, so we were looking at the world from SOAS, numbers and quantitative reasoning, and then digital skills and technology. So I'm not sure where I cut out. Did we get to digital skills and technology, Amy and Sakina? Can you remember? <laughs> Can um, you still I, hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. Um, I think you had were still on the um numbers and quantitative numbers and quantitative reasoning. Okay. So, so um, I was just yeah. saying. I was just saying with numbers and quantitative reasoning, how helpful it can really be. It's not just helpful, it's really essential for students planning to study economics, finance, or any business subject looking forward. But social sciences students have also found it really helpful in terms of analyzing the research of others and learning the skills they need to produce really strong arguments. Moving on then to digital skills and technology, which was originally designed as a module that was more focused on giving you skills you might need in the workplace. So each week on digital skills and technology, you'll focus on building a different skill. So maybe in week two, producing a podcast, week three, maybe editing a video, week four, producing a web page. So that even if you know how to maybe do the skill focused on in week three, you might not in week four. So there's a real range of really useful skills taught in digital skills and technology. The assessment is a portfolio. So for the portfolio, you really do take these skills and put them into practice to produce a portfolio of your own work. Um, and all of the different tasks, there's a lot of freedom with the different tasks that you can do. So for example, designing your own web page or producing and editing your own video. So all this is hugely helpful, obviously in relation to your future careers in the workplace, but the two guys who designed and teach digital skills and technology, Michael and Andrew, have also made this course very academically relevant because through learning to do these skills, there's also a lot of reflection on their relevance to different academic problems and issues. Um, and this is 
I think, a really fulfilling and exciting module and one that you won't find in other universities. I think it's very much ahead of the curve. Okay, so there are the different modules you would be studying on the foundation year. Just go over them again. We have two introductory modules, Introduction to Business Management Economics and Law, or Introduction to Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities. You'll also be studying academic practice throughout the year. Um, and then in term one, there's the world from SOAS, followed in term two by cultural fluency. And then in term one, there is digital skills and technology, followed in term two by numbers and quantitative reasoning. Woo. Now, another reason the foundation year, I think, is outstanding as an experience in itself, but also as preparation for university study, is the range of different assessments. The assessments are designed in a way that should be really personally engaging and interesting for all students, and that really takes into account the different backgrounds that students come to the foundation year from. But it's also excellent preparation for the type of assessments you'll be doing as an undergraduate. So hopefully you have a huge head start on other students in first year when you progress onto your degree, because you'll already know what's expected of a really high level academic essay or um, academic presentation or reflective evaluation journal. Um, and as I mentioned it before, but it's worth restating because it's such a great assessment. The independent study project really is an opportunity to follow your own interests by researching on a subject or topic that's really engaging for you. I mentioned this before, but don't forget that students who pass the foundation year can progress onto any other undergraduate program in the university. So you automatically go on to law, development studies, cultural studies, global liberal arts, anthropology, Korean, Japanese, South Asian arts, once you pass the foundation year. You choose at the end of the foundation year which degree you want to take. And once you pass, you go on to it. Um, foundation year students are SOAS students. You are on a SOAS degree once you're on the foundation year. So you should have access to all the benefit services and facilities available to undergraduate students. Uh, for example, you become a member of the Students' Union. If you haven't had a chance to Google SOAS stu Students' Union, I would say it's a great idea. It's a really vibrant Students' Union. The range of different societies and clubs is outstanding. So that might be worth having a look at after this very quick lecture. The foundation year only began in 2019, which meant that first group of foundation year students completed the foundation year in 2020 and went on to be first year SOAS students in 2020-21. So this summer, we got the first results from the end of first year of the group who had been in the foundation year the previous year. And the data across the board showed that foundation year students were doing as well or almost as well as students who had entered those degrees with direct entry for nearly all courses. And on some courses like finance, for example, students who had taken the foundation year were performing better, were getting higher results than students who had gone out to finance with direct entry. And if you have a look at the SOAS undergraduate perspective, prospectus, you'll see that SOAS has very high direct entry um, requirements. So if you wanted to study law or economics or finance and SOAS, to enter directly, you probably need an AAA, AAB in your um, A levels. So the point I'm making here is that the foundation year or the data we're getting back 
is telling us that the foundation year really is effective for preparing students for undergraduate study. Who would the foundation year suit? Who would the foundation year suit? How would you know the foundation year is right for you? Well, if you're a student who might have been out of education for a while, maybe um, you left school early or a long time ago and now want to return to education, then the foundation year could be a really good bridge back into um, serious full-time study for you. For any student who feels that they would just need a little bit more time to build their academic skills and academic knowledge before going on to their degree, then the foundation year could really suit you. If you're an ambitious student who isn't quite sure what they want to do in the future or what path they'd like to take, what degree really interests them, then the foundation year would give you an opportunity to learn more about academic study and the different disciplines we study in SOAS, while at the same time building your knowledge and skills. And um, the foundation year obviously attracts students who really want to study in SOAS, but might have just missed the requirements for direct entry. And then the foundation year should, first of all, give those students the opportunity to study in SOAS, but also then to really improve their skills so that when they do go on to their degree, they can excel. Okay, so that is me certainly run out of breath and my short presentation over. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Sakina and Alice. Oh, sorry, not Sakina and Alice. Alice and Nauta, did, did any of that make sense? Uh, yeah, it did, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Nauta, did any of that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I understand okay. uh, your explanation. Yeah. Okay. It's really hard to know when you're lecturing online and can't see people if you're talking nonsense or not. So, okay. Any questions, Alice? I think there might be a question from Jenny in the chat, actually. Okay. Sorry, I didn't have the chat open. Hi, Jenny. What are the entry requirements? for foundation year. Um, the entry requirements for foundation year are CCC um, at A level. If you are from a widening participation background, we might consider, uh, consider you if you've slightly lower marks um, during clearing. Yeah. The standard is CCC or assured entry onto the foundation. Is that okay? So Jenny, any other questions? Nato and Alice? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you so much for your explanation. Okay, great. My pleasure. Alice, any thoughts? Yeah, I actually do have a question. Um, oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask, do you, um, would you say that it was essential to be based in London to do the foundation course, or would it be possible to travel in if you live kind of within an hour's, within an hour from the campus? Yeah, so we would have a lot of students who were traveling an hour each way, um, and a lot of staff who were traveling much further than that. But you'd need to be aware that a university timetable is usually not a regular nine to five timetable in terms of uh, seminars and lectures. So you might, for example, have one lecture at nine on a Monday morning and nothing else on that day. And then a seminar at 11 on Tuesday and a seminar at three on Thursday on Tuesday. Or in other words, on your 
timetable on the foundation year, you'll have about 10 or 11 hours of contact time. And that really means lecture and seminar time. But you'll also need to give yourself plenty of time to use the library, uh, to be doing your own reading, and to be preparing for assignments. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. So it's not like, um, it's quite full on. It's a full-time course, isn't it? It's not, you can't- It's a full-time course, but there's some flexibility within that timetable. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so. That's all my questions. Okay, okay great. Jenny, anything else? Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming today. If you do have any questions, please do write to us at, I'm going to put it in the chat, foundation, soas.ac.uk. You could also have a look at the SOAS Foundation Year website. Maybe some of the information you need is there. But if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact us at foundation at soas.ac.uk. Even if you don't take the Foundation Year, hopefully we'll see you in SOAS next year. Okay, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks also to Sakina and Amy. And hopefully see you guys in September, October of 2022.